Welcome to the Akashic Reading Podcast, presented by AkashicReading.com, the place where you can learn to access your soul's wisdom, or at least stop digging the hole any deeper. I'm your host, Terry Uctana, and today we'll be looking into what it means for each of us if we're not broken, or fallen, or in need of saving, and instead are a member in good standing of the sacred universe. All life is a conversation. All things animate and inanimate are constantly interacting with each other, creating a complexity of interconnectivity that is overwhelming in its enormity and awesome in its beauty. Some interactions are nurturing and supportive. Some are destructive and disharmonious. And all are a part of the whole and thereby have their place. Humans set values on these interactions, labeling them as good or bad via their own limited perspectives on the entirety of the interconnected web and its functioning. But as we've seen, human perspectives are only one of many, and the numinous is far more vast and varied than our perceptions would lead us to believe. Scientists are still discovering the components that make matter and allow it to interact, and still have not found a reason why it does so. Our ability to see the cause and effect of things, or the entirety of any pattern, and therefore the multiplicity of meanings connected with it, is many times minimal at best. Historically, humans' ability to reason, to use intellect to distill meaning out of experience, and To explore beyond empirical facts has allowed us to form understandings about the greater cosmos and our relationship to it. Some of these notions have become accepted almost as self-evident truths by which a majority of peoples have based their cultures. One of these is man's dominion over the earth and all its creatures. The notion that humankind is the ruler of all things, and that they are therefore his to use, control, and manipulate, has existed for several millennia. This notion, possibly formed as early as the technology for agriculture, was conceived. If man can plant where and when he wants, if he can create a home and maintain it rather than living nomadically and at the whim of other creatures, then he has mastered the earth and the weather and the plant kingdom. And animal husbandry supports the same message. Being able to manage and manipulate animals makes man seem transcendent and in control. Humankind's ability to create meaning, to control, and to use things for his own benefit or whim is fueled through imagination and the ability to innovate. Both of these things wax and wane throughout history, creating new cultures in an explosion of ideas. The cultures flourish and become until the structure of them stifles and Then a new wave of innovation comes from the imagination of the young. Meanwhile, the concept of humanity as supreme being on earth is continuously tested by the bane of all mental constructs, empirical facts. Because just as weather events show humans that their architectural constructs, which seem to conquer both geography and time, are actually rather delicate and easily destroyed, so too their inventions of convenience and power show that their control over animate and inanimate things is ephemeral by their refusal to cooperate. For example, nuclear materials refuse to be easily contained, to remain contained, or to allow for disposal. Plastics resist being temporary or disposable or even returning to their constituent particles in appropriate time spans. Fat substitutes, like Alestra, cause more harm than good. GMO crops continue to cause side effects and allergic reactions. And introduction of invasive species, like the Indian mongoose and feral cat to the Hawaiian Islands in an attempt to target other unwanted species, has decimated the native ecosystems. Some see this not as a failure of the thought construct of man as ruler of the physical, but as simply evidence that man's rule has not yet come to fruition. Many religions reinforce this self-evident notion of man as ruler by creating hierarchies of existence. At the bottom is inanimate matter, such as rock or water or air, then animate objects, such as plants and trees, then animals, from the smallest life form to the largest mammal, 
over all of which man presides. The spiritual realms are thought to mimic this, but placing man at the bottom of the hierarchy of beings. So man, while ruler of everything physical, is concomitantly ruled by most, if not all, things spiritual. This sets up a strange dichotomy in which humanity is all-powerful in the physical, ruled only by its own conscience and morality, and yet is completely helpless in spiritual matters without responsibility or control over its own destiny. Which brings us to another concept that is accepted as self-evident, that humankind was at one time in perfect harmony with God, in correct and complete relationship to all things, and therefore perfect in itself in all aspects. And then, for various reasons, such as mankind transgressing, breaking the rules, and falling from the grace of God, his nature is now considered imperfect and fallen. All life for humanity is therefore an attempt to reachieve perfection, its place in the cosmos, and God's good graces. From this comes the notion of original sin, the concept of karma, the ideas of heaven, hell, and purgatory, the celestial kingdom, and the need for salvation and redemption. This fallen nature is seen in the ongoing argument between whether good works can get you into heaven or only grace, which is God's infinite love and forgiveness. Many religions around the world are biased towards valuing constructs and control in order to create community, foster the creation of the spiritual kingdom on earth, and combat those forces, either external or internal, which prevent humanity from returning to its perfected state. In doing so, using mental constructs to create meaning, they see the loss of control and loss of structure as unvalued and even dangerous. These things are pictured as opposite, as monstrous, as chaos, as the worst things that could possibly exist and that will destroy humanity if allowed any leeway at all. Chaos is pictured as the abyss, as Tiamat the great snake, as the unformed, overwhelming destruction of everything. In this perspective, humans must work tirelessly to prevent chaos from regaining control over the world. Meanwhile, God is allowed to have power over humanity, to be unknowable and therefore chaotic only inasmuch as we have been created in his image. God, therefore, isn't truly unknowable, just not yet fully known, and Mankind will know all there is to know in time, so this much lack of control and knowledge is acceptable, as it's all geared for humanity's benefit in the end. But what if these self-evident thought constructs were not self-evident? What if they were, indeed, just constructs? What if we weren't even keen players in the world? As we've seen, nature refuses to be controlled and has sacred places where we aren't necessary for sacrality to exist. There are conversations with the numinous happening all around us every day that have absolutely nothing to do with us. What happens to us if we're no longer defined by our being the top of the evolutionary chain? What if we aren't fallen, and our being able to return home to the all that is, is guaranteed? There are other ways to perceive humanity and its role in the cosmos. Each of us is able to participate in a conversation with the numinous as a unique individual. The experience of I am allows each of us to embody the concept of being in an interconnected, respectful relationship, not only with the numinous, but also with everything around us. Recognizing the elements of the conversation all the voices speaking and the messages they convey gives us the opportunity to participate in the world not as a ruler over it, but an active member of it. But what does it mean to be a member of the world? So let's look at different concepts of humanity and its role in the interconnected web of everything. In fact, let's turn these concepts on their heads. Instead of forming structure and culture from the perspective of humanity's fallen nature, doomed to an embodied life, perhaps the structure could be formed around humanity being spiritual beings that live in harmony with the all that is, which includes the physical. And what if an embodied life was not a fall from grace, 
a rebellion, a mistake, or misstep, but instead a choice? What if, instead of being a punishment, physical life was an opportunity to learn and become and more fully understand what it means to live? What if this earth provided a challenging environment that confronts us with the need to utilize free will, responsibility, and right action, or at least to try? What if our embodied life were only one portion of a much greater life that continues after the embodiment ends? What if the embodied life is only an interlude and not the goal of humanity? If these are concepts of what humanity is, then who are we? Just to be clear, none of these concepts are things I invented or just theories that I'm throwing out there. Aboriginal cultures around the globe have seen themselves and the world in this fashion since time immemorial. My extensive work with the Akashics reaffirms this for me every day. And being Cherokee helps me to see human beings as unique and amazing individuals, each created within and of the numinous, each having their own role to play in the all that is, yet each no more or no better than any other creature or thing within the cosmos. Everything, including them, is made from the stuff of stars. All is equal and should be seen and treated as such. Human beings are neither fallen in nature, nor are they any more perfect than any other creature. Every human being is a work in progress, learning by doing, becoming through living, and while mistakes are inevitable, they are also some of the greatest teachers. So being perfect is not the goal, nor is attempting to create a fiction of superiority or control over our fellow creatures. If we and the rivers and the mountains and the plains and the wind currents are all created from the same stuff, then we should treat them with the same respect we would wish to experience. And we should see these things as fellow travelers, experiencing life right here along with us. Native Americans and First Nation tribes incorporate these concepts of humanity and its role in the interconnected web of life into their cultures explicitly. Few of these tribes even have words for religion. Instead, They see spirituality as just the way to live life. Some speak of considering the seven generations that came before us and the seven generations that will come after us in each choice we make and each action we take every moment of the day. Consider how it would feel to know that you are an ancestor right now. That your life will be the history your family and friends' families will build their lives from. That your life whether rebelling against, innovating from, or following in the footsteps of, is built on and reflects on the lives of those people who caused you to be born and provided you the opportunities for your life. You are connected. How do you honor those connections? Native American educational practices echo this way of interacting in the world. The first lesson for any Native child is to listen. This is not the same thing as being seen and not heard, but instead means that adults want children underfoot, want them to be curious, want them to absorb everything, and so include them in everything. Children are everywhere, but learn first to listen and to watch what is happening instead of asking questions. They learn by doing right along with their elders and learn from experiencing the wisdom of their elders and the jewels they have to offer. Instead of attempting to conquer and master a subject or skill, they respect it, attempt it, and know they will never really learn it all or master it. It will be part of their lives in a life full of learning and experiencing and doing, and their children will learn it from them in time. Some tribes build sweat lodges in order to pray and heal and return to harmony with the all that is when life has nudged or yanked them off track. Many tribes build sweat lodges with very small doors low to the ground. This is so entering into the space requires getting on all fours and being humbled to the ground. 
It's an opportunity for each individual to remember and honor their true role in the scheme of things in the same way as using the phrase, I'm a humble human being during prayer puts things in perspective. To understand more fully this way of perceiving humanity in the greater cosmos, I recommend studying the concept of the medicine wheel. Each tribe has its own understanding of it, so particular points may differ, but the concept rarely varies. It's not just a direction wheel, but a means to understand that everything is cyclical and everything is connected. Each quarter has a season, a color, unique attributes, emotions, phases of life, perspectives, animal totems, and so much more. And while it utilizes lines and dots to delineate its structure, in reality, everything about it is connected and nothing is separate. It's all a thought construct that helps us understand the world around us and our place in it. When I'm working with students, I sometimes suggest they use the wheel as a meditation tool to examine their lives. I have them make a wheel either with stones or sticks or even just drawn on paper. I then instruct them to enter the wheel at the east and then walk to the south and agree to spend one month experiencing the south. They then exit the wheel from the south. Throughout the month, they journal what life is like from a southern perspective as they experience it, because their life will be all about it whether they like it or not. Once done, they then move to the west and the north and so on, month to month, until they have done a complete circuit. Spending a month in each direction takes the experience of learning out of people's heads and makes it visceral and applicable to everyday life. The wheel becomes much more than a concept and connects to real life so we can live it every day. Because in the end, all historical evidence to the contrary, we are just as sacred as what we consider sacred space. This is the secret to consecration, not some mystical power, some Lemurian key, or leftover alien DNA. We are sacred, and within us resides sacred space. We don't need to seek it in some far away other where that is forever out of reach. We don't need to mourn our separation from it or or wait some future time when we'll return to it. As spiritual beings, we choose to live an embodied life knowing the bodies we enter are built to support us by helping us forget aspects of our true nature, what would distract us from experiencing this life now. We are meant to live in this condensed form, fully experiencing input from our senses, raw emotions in their glory, and choice upon choice upon choice, all without the hindrance of knowing what we were before and what we will again be after. We are what we are, and our connection to the numinous is eternal and ever-present. It is what we utilize to consecrate sacred space what we draw on to form altars, what we connect with to hear and feel the conversation with the numinous in religious sacred spaces, and what awakens us when we are in sacred places. Practicing connection with I am by standing still, centering the self, then stating the truth, I am, allows you to connect fully and consciously with your soul. It allows your sacred being to exist in harmony with your consciously lived self, reconnecting all of yourself in one place, making you fully present and fully sacred. Being sacred doesn't make us perfect, infallible, or even right, but it does make us alive. It allows us to open ourselves up to being. It is what each of us experiences when we stay very still and say, I am. That thought, feeling, and emotion is our sacrality reaching out into the world. And if we are still enough, open enough, joyous enough, wildly abandoned enough, we may hear it respond back in kind. And that's all the time we have this week. If you're interested in knowing more, check out my website, akashicreading.com. And if you're enjoying this podcast, please consider supporting it by subscribing on Patreon. You can see all my other offerings and get regular updates about what I'm working on at patreon.com slash Terry 
Thanks. Bye.